On Tech News Today, Verizon is buying AOL. Streaming music is killing downloads, and a startup is launching a consumer camera drone with no controls. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, May 12th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin. Our co-anchor today is After Nine's content czar, Joe Panateri. How are you doing, Joe? Mike, I'm doing awesome. How have you been? I've been fantastic. Thank you so very much. You said you were uh, doing something to your house <laughs> Something uh, that sounded like work. What 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 is you? What were you talking about? It was work, actually. And you know, as as an entrepreneur, um, cash flow is always very important to me. And uh, instead of paying someone to uh, power wash our house, I uh, actually did the manual labor myself and survived and lived to talk about it. Yeah, manual labor is the worst kind, as far as I'm concerned. I'm more of an ideas guy. Don't really like to work around the house, but. That's just me. Uh, I do like to work on the, the 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 family website, however. But it's another story. Well, one anything we, new? Any, anything new going on there on that family website? Oh, we got big plans coming out. We're actually we just move all our domains over to Hover.com finally, and uh, we're going to be launching. Uh, my wife and I own a company called Elgin Media. We're going to be launching a new Elgin Media page. Thank you for letting me plug it. Uh, that is uh, probably going to come out in two or three weeks. And it'll be for our various things where we both write stuff and it's all for that. So Very we, cool. and we are a Same. California co corporation, not Delaware. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. So you, you, so you actually pay taxes every year. We actually do. And it's a ridiculously <laughs> high amount of taxes <laughs> and it makes me sad every time we do it. But what are you going to do? Well, our top story today, Verizon announced this morning that it's buying AOL for $4.4 billion. AOL CEO Tim, Str Tim Armstrong will keep his job after the acquisition, in other words, he ne negotiated himself a sweet deal. Brian Fung is a reporter for the Washington Post and joins us now. Welcome to you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Now, this is assumed to be an acquisition that's mostly about advertising. Can you talk about what advertising gets in this deal that will boost its ability to make money from advertising? Sure. So this deal, uh, at the end of the day, is um, all about helping Verizon make more money off of the videos that uh, it wants to stream to people like you and me through uh, cellular connections. So, um, you know, it's uh, Verizon has recently announced that um, it wants to start exploring its own streaming app kind of to compete to uh, with uh, Hulu and Netflix and the likes of those those companies. Um, and and uh, by taking up AOL's uh, advertising technology, um, Verizon would theoretically be able to uh, to earn more revenue off of uh, off of the videos that it streams. Hey Brian, does that basically mean that that uh, Verizon is planning to marry AOL's technology, that ad technology, with with uh, I think it was a technology called OnQ that Verizon acquired last year. Right, uh, OnQ you may remember was a technology that was developed by Intel, um, and Verizon bought that last year. Um, and it seems uh, like a likely partnership uh, that you know all of this is um, sort of geared toward uh, Verizon's plan to uh, to break into the online video market. Um, now, what we haven't really talked about is uh, what this means for AOL's content businesses, and um, that's a really uh, big and interesting topic. There, um, you know, what what Verizon is essentially doing with this uh, merger or this acquisition, um, even though it's sort of choosing to play up the the ad tech sides of it. Um, um, is it's getting access to a, a boatload of content through the Huffington Post, uh, through Engadget, um, through TechCrunch, and uh, and you know all of that content will be controlled by Verizon, which also happens to control uh, many of the the internet pipes uh, through which this content would be potentially delivered. So. Uh, not only do you have a marrying of, uh, of ad tech and video technology, you also have a marrying here potentially of content and distribution. The total number of bloggers uh, in this Huffington Post uh, media group um, division 
is something like uh, in excess of 20,000 loggers, uh, most of whom are unpaid, famously, through Huffington Post. Of course, Engadget and TechCrunch does pay their uh, bloggers, although not enough, in my opinion. Uh, there are rumors circulating that Verizon may be interested in spinning this off, and certainly there were rumors that AOL wanted to spin off the content uh, part of the group. Do you think that this is, uh, first of all, have you heard these rumors? And second of all, do you think that's a good idea for the company or a bad idea? Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the rumors. Um, you know, I think it's uh, an interesting thought. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's, uh, I can't speak to whether or not those rumors are true or not. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think certainly um, if, you know, this, this acquisition has to be approved by federal regulators and, uh, you know, one certain, certainly one aspect uh, or question that's going to be relevant um, in their analysis is whether or not Verizon will have the power uh, to be a gatekeeper to information. And, uh, and if Verizon spins off uh, the Huffington Post, um, that might uh, alleviate some of those concerns. Hey, Brian, let, let's also do a, a time warp here. I, I believe AOL still has about roughly 2.1 million dial-up customers. You know, there's, there's 56 kilobit per second customers who are getting on the Internet through AOL. Is Verizon going to hold on to that business or, or sell it off or sunset it or kill it? Any thoughts there? So the main line that Verizon is putting out this morning is uh, that um, nothing about AOL is going to be changing um, in the near term. So, uh, you know, <laughs> AOL's CEO is going to stay the same. The internal structure, uh, you know, within AOL is going to stay the same. Um, nothing is going to change as far as the how the businesses are run on the day-to-day. -day. Um, so by that logic, uh, you know, you seems reasonable to assume that um, Verizon would also be inheriting all those dial-up customers without necessarily, um, you know, having a plan for, for uh, you know, how to, how to deal with them. Um, uh, and the dial-up customers are one of AOL's biggest revenue streams, um, and uh, they, they um, you know, it's consistently, people consistently write about um, AOL's dial-up uh, customers as being kind of like a uh, an anachronism, but it's um, uh, one of the key ways that uh, AOL makes makes much of its money, and um, I would expect that uh, these these customers are going to be really important for Verizon moving forward. We've gotten a bunch of mail from uh, uh, viewers and listeners who say that they they continue to have these uh, AOL uh, dial-up service connections because they use it as a low-tech backup when everything else fails. They could always just you know, go over the phone lines at uh, 56 uh, KBPS. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's awful, but it's something. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. We assumed that it was a whole bunch of people who didn't know they were paying and who were essentially being duped and so on. <laughs> so, uh, but it's good to know some people are doing it on purpose and actually feeling that there's some benefit to it. Brian Fung is at the Washington Post, or I'm sorry, it's WashingtonPost.com. There's no the in WashingtonPost.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at B underscore Fung. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brian. My pleasure. Well, uh, we got some more news for you in just a second, but first let's talk about hiring great people. We were just we're talking about hiring great people, but let's talk about you hiring great people for your department, for your small business. You got to use ZipRecruiter because it's the best place to hire, to go to hire great people. You can post to 100 plus job sites with a single click. You can also post on the social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Google Plus. You can even automatically tweet every single job you post and that's a great way to do it. I've seen uh, some companies that do that, and it looks very, very successful. It's a great way to get, uh, get in there early with the very best candidates. And again, you just post once, and within 24 hours, the candidates roll in, and ZipRecruiter will help you sort through the most qualified candidates. That's right. You don't have to slog through every single response you get because you're going to get a ton of responses with ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter will actually filter out those that really aren't qualified according to your criteria so you can focus on the ones that are truly qualified. You can even search more than 5 million resumes in ZipRecruiter's uh, resume database and they add thousands of new resumes every single day. So it's a great resource. And if you searched it yesterday, search it again today because there are new candidates in there. Uh, and again, that's just a freebie that you get just for using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter has been used by more than 400,000 businesses and delivered more than 53 million candidate applications. You got to uh, use ZipRecruiter to help you build a great department, a great business, 
It's the only way to go. Try ZipRecruiter with a free 4-day trial and get your perfect candidate before they go to somebody else by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com. And don't forget the slash TNT part at the end. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support. The White House yesterday announced the appointment of Ed Felton as Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer. Felton is a computer science professor at Princeton. VentureBeat Editor-in-Chief Dylan Twenty joins us now to talk about this. Welcome to you, Dylan. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being on. Now, isn't Felton on record as being strongly anti-government on a whole bunch of issues? Why would the White House hire him? Well, you could call him anti-government. He's certainly been critical um, of, of many government positions. He's uh, criticized the NSA and the policy of sort of blanket surveillance of telephone call records. He's, uh, he's also been on record against DRM, which the music industry has supported. And he's strongly criticized and, in fact, demonstrated weaknesses in uh, some electronic voting machines from Diebold that various governments have used. But he's also held some government roles. So uh, he was with the FTC earlier as their first um, chief technologist, and he's worked um, on antitrust stuff. So he's not a complete outsider. Hey, hey Dylan, can you give us any perspective on, on what a U.S. chief technology act, uh, U.S. chief technology officer actually does? And the reason I ask is is the Obama administration has made a lot of IT hires from Google and other areas, and I don't think people understand sort of how they all fit together into a bigger initiative. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, at a company, you would expect that the CTO would be the one sort of setting the technology direction and, and deciding, you know, making purchase decisions and so forth. Um, and making strategy decisions. I think um, the White House CTO, which is actually Megan Smith, formerly a, a Google executive, um, and she's the one who hired in Ed as a, as a deputy. So I think their, their mission, the mission of that office is basically to help the White House make smarter decisions um, about technology and about policy things that might affect the direction of, of, uh, of technology. So having somebody who's critical and sort of inside and outside like Ed, um, actually makes a lot of sense. It makes sense uh, theoretically, uh, but, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I always think when these high-powered people, you know, really, it's really, they're hiring great people, uh, they go into government, I'm afraid that the inertia of government, just the, the, the built-in uh, bureaucracy of it, is just going to be a waste of good people, good talent. Um, do you think that they'll actually be able to be effective in any meaningful way uh, in their roles? Well, it's possible, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the White House, you know, the administration has actually had a pretty NSA and surveillance friendly um, attitude um, for basically all of um, Obama's two, two administrations. So I wouldn't expect radical changes to happen just because they um, appointed Ed Felton. But it is interesting that Obama and his team seem genuinely interested in bringing in um, talented and accomplished and well-credentialed people even if they don't toe the party line. And I think that's mm. a really good sign. It's a really healthy sign for an administration. And one can only hope that there will be some momentum behind that and that, you know, maybe decisions will continue to be made for political reasons and bureaucratic reasons. That's going to always be the case. But the more smart people you have in government, the more hope there is that they might actually have an impact and um, the feds might make a smart decision here and there. Hey, Dylan, any clues in terms of uh, how Ed may influence the open government initiatives? And what I mean by that is, you know, the, the Obama administration and state leaders as well throughout the U.S. have really been pushing for open government efforts where the data, the rich data becomes much more accessible in, in a secure way to us, the citizens. Yeah. Um, any, any clues there as to what we may see out of the White House and the administration going forward? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, I could speculate. I mean, Felton is a computer scientist. He's a professor, right? So he understands that data needs to be well-structured in order to be used, and it needs to be presented in ways that can be manipulated. Um, so far, the emphasis on that open uh, data initiative has been mostly on getting the data out in any form at all, and usually that's meant dumping piles of PDFs, which hmm. people then have to go through and like kind of write scripts and stuff to extract the actual data. Um, you could hope that having a, a really well-credentialed computer scientist in this position might mean that they'd start thinking about, you know, publishing uh, CSV files or actual databases, which would be easier and cleaner to manipulate. But I'm just speculating. Dylan, does do these uh, uh, the whole the whole division, Megan and, and all the rest, do they stick around after Obama leaves, or do they go with the Obama administration? 
No, this is a you know this is an administ an, it, it won't last longer than than the term of the administration. And actually, looking at the previous um, people who've been in this role, it's probably a one or two year role before they move on to something else. Hmm. Interesting. Dylan Twenty is at VentureBeat.com. You can follow him on Dylan Twenty, the number twenty. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dylan. Thanks a lot. All right. Let us know what you think of this story by sending email to TNT at twit.tv. Uh, do you think this is a waste of good talent or do you think it's a good place to uh, to put smart people into the government? Maker Media unveiled today a new social network called Makerspace, where people who make stuff can talk about their projects, according to a report on Verizon's TechCrunch. The site will have a following, have a following feature like Tumblr or Facebook. Makerspace is now open for a limited beta. You can sign up at makerspace.com. The beta closes on Monday, though, so act now. The site will be open to the public at some undisclosed point in the future. Uh, Joe Panateri, this seems like an awesome uh, resource, uh, a social network for people who make stuff. Absolutely. You know, and, and the other term uh, people may be familiar with is, is hacker space. The whole idea that people come together here and piece together solutions. And, you know, Mike, I couldn't help when I heard about Makerspace, I couldn't help but think of Radio Shack. And ironically, yeah. you and I have waxed poetic about the history of Radio Shack and, and what could have potentially saved that uh, over time as, yeah. as, as it lost relevance. The whole idea that we'd all go to Radio Shack, pick up all these components, and then make something with it, and then talk with other people about what we made, that, that's sort of what Makerspace brings this virtual environment for whether it's 3D printing or coding or things of that nature. I signed up for the beta this morning. I'm anxious to get in. Yeah, me too. I signed up as well. And I, I actually have to say that I think this is kind of bad news for Google+. Plus. Because a lot of makers are currently on Google+. Plus. It's got a very active maker community in all kinds of areas. Not just like the kind of making that you think of, little robots and technology projects, but things that sort of, uh, you know, are on the boundaries. You know, the, the Lego fans and people who just right. like to create things and share their enthusiasms in communities and on their, on their profiles. And that's one of the strong points of Google+. Plus. And with this out there, it's more competition in that space. So it's probably bad news for Google+. Plus, but... What are you going to do? It's good news for makers. Uh, they'll have at least a choice and certainly a place where everybody who's on the social network is really enthusiastic about uh, doing it yourself. Well, uh, we got some follow-ups for you. We told you yesterday about the Associated Press's exclusive on the four accidents that self-driving cars have been involved in since September in California. In response to that report, Google posted more details on Medium's back channel, by the way, Another slam against Google+. Plus. Normally, they post this stuff on Google+. Plus. The company <laughs> reported that its self-driving cars have been involved actually in 11 accidents since the beginning of the project and that none of them were the fault of self-driving cars. And Joe Panateri, we had a quick uh, conversation on this yesterday saying that you know a lot of people who are skimming headlines walk away from the story thinking, oh, no, the self-driving cars actually get into right. accidents. But in fact, as Google is confirming here, they've never caused a single accident. That's a pretty good record as far as I'm concerned. A very good record. And, you know, it, it's usually whenever it comes to computers, it, it's usually the user's fault rather than the computer's yeah. fault, whether we're talking about a PC, a notebook or now a car. What I'm curious about, though, is that, you know, well, in the report that we talked about yesterday, uh, there were four accidents. Two of them uh, had the self-driving mechanisms in control of the vehicle at the time that, of, uh, that somebody else crashed into them. And the mm -hmm. other two times, it was just somebody driving the car, and, and the, the self-driving feature was actually turned off. I wonder how good self-driving cars are going to be at avoiding accidents that are not their fault. For example, some car comes flying over the, the median uh, right at your car. How good are they going to be at veering away and, and dodging and without taking out the sort of bevy of bicyclists on the side of the... You know, you can see how programmatically they could get more and more without sophisticated. Taking out, <laughs> without taking out the Google bikes on the sidewalk? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or the <laughs> Google drones that are flying nearby or any of the rest. No, but it's, it's like, you know, it, yeah. this is really the... I think that they've already demonstrated the potential to not cause accidents. And now the big question is, how good are they at avoiding accidents that are caused by others, by human drivers? And I'm, yeah, I'm you know, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think overall, though, people are just freaked out about this whole conversation. I, I think people are all about control when they get in their cars. I, I know I, for one, I hate sitting shotgun. I've got to be driving. So to, to give up control to Google, while it may even be safer... I got to get past this mental block and allow it to happen. I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite ready to let it happen. I'm ready, man. I, I just, I, I just wake me up when I get to work. You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, I, I don't care. I can read. It's like, it's, it's such wasted time, you know, to drive as far as, and I enjoy driving too, but 
Uh, I also like to, you know, do a lot of stuff, read and, and, and do other things besides driving. So we'll see where it goes. I think it'll be a few years before these things are actually on the market, probably at least five or 10 years. So I don't think we're ready anytime soon to have them just legally driving us around. Uh, without ever touching the wheel. Well, in product update news, the peer-to-peer -peer mobile messaging service Tango announced today the addition of shopping services to the Tango app. Tango's new catalog includes about 2 million products from Walmart and Alibaba. Now, the Alibaba, is an, uh, Alibaba is an investor in Tango and pumped about $250 million in the company last year. You know, Joe, it's getting irritating. Th these messaging apps don't want to be messaging apps. They want to be anything but. They want to sell us stuff and have our they credit want to cards and all the rest. Yeah, upsell, cross-sell, and re-engage at every moment. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, you know, text my wife and say, you know, hey, what's going on? Should I stop at the store? I don't want to. Well, of course, I could buy it on Alibaba if they sold, you know, milk and stuff like that. Well, anyway, so we got some more news for you coming up and some really, really interesting big numbers. But first, let's talk about Prosper. Prosper is the modern way to borrow money. You don't want to borrow from the bank. You don't want to borrow from friends or family. That's a terrible, terrible idea. You want to borrow from Prosper because Prosper has a system that will enable people to actually invest in you and your project. So, so the people who are uh, loaning the money, who are investing in you, actually select you to invest in because they believe in what you're doing and, and they want to actually earn a good return for themselves. You can get up to $35,000 in as few days and pay off high-rate credit cards, fix up your house, buy a new car, finance an environmentally friendly project with a green loan. You can even boost your small business. Prosper's online market space connects people who need money with those who want to invest. Don't rack up more debt on your credit cards. You want to pay them off with Prosper, and Prosper has funded more than $2 billion in loans. You can check your low rate instantly without affecting your good credit. Just go to prosper.com slash twit. And for a limited time, Prosper is offering twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card with your low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer that is just for twit fans. And we thank Prosper for their support of Tech News Today. Well, here come the big numbers, 33 that's the percentage growth in streaming music revenue reported by Warner Music in the most recently reported fiscal quarter. The surge in revenue put streaming revenue over music download revenue for the first time ever, Joe Penitary. This is a huge milestone in the in the history of music. And I think the big takeaway here is that the, the revenue for downloads, you know, the old iTunes model, is just, it's just dying. It's going off the cliff. This is over. Yeah, you know, we're seeing faster and faster cycles when it comes to technology, and, and you're exactly right. Whenever Apple announces earnings these days, there's always that iTunes concern. Um, but then again, maybe I'm not the guy who should be commenting about this. If you look over my shoulder, there are several, <laughs> hundreds, several hundred CDs sitting there, and they don't collect dust. I still, I still use them. Well, uh, and we've had somebody on the show recently that had an amazing collection of records. I don't know if you were co-anchoring right. that day. But yes, I was on that yeah, one. Yeah, so, um, so you have the non-hipster version of that uh, <laughs> whole model. Well, okay, well, here's another number for you. This is actually a low number, and the lower the better. The number is 4.58. That's the percentage of errors reported on a key test of artificial intelligence for Baidu's Minhua supercomputer. Baidu is a search engine and web services company based in China. The test involves scanning a million pictures and sorting them into about a thousand categories. Now, just by comparison, Microsoft has achieved a 4.94% error rate. Google has achieved a 4.8% error rate. And Baidu now holds the record for the lowest error rate, which, again, is 4.58. Humans, by the way, average around 5% error rate. So all of these companies are doing better than humans at recognizing and categorizing photographs. The singularity is coming, Joe, and it looks like it may come first in China. Yeah, uh, it's going to come first in China. We'll see if our, our innovative uh, folks up in Redmond and down in Silicon Valley can close the gap. And you know, it doesn't sound like there's this big delta here. We're talking about 4.58 from uh, that, that Chinese supercomputer versus 4.94 uh, over at Microsoft. Um, but, you know, Mike, as you get into the millions and millions and millions of images, that's a big delta between the two error rates. So, so Microsoft and Google both have some uh, gaps to close here. Yeah, and I'm sure they will. But of course, Baidu is also building a next generation supercomputer that's going to cost a fortune and be much, much, much more powerful. Of course, everybody's always doing that. And, and in fact, the one that they're building is going to be in the top 10 most powerful supercomputers in the world, including government computers. Well, I'm really excited about this next 
uh, segment in news you can use. Really excited because I'm a gadget fiend who's also a raving narcissist. A company called Lily plans to sell an $899 flying camera. Yeah, it's a drone, but they don't like the D word. The product is designed exclusively for flying selfies. You just wear or carry an included tracker, throw the drone into the air, and the Lily camera will follow you around and take HD video of you no matter what you do or where you go. It has no remote control. Literally, it has no way for you to control it. The camera itself will shoot a max of 1080p at 60 frames per second video. It even has face recognition. Once it learns your face, it'll keep the camera on you. It'll keep you in frame even when other people are milling around. And here's a bonus tip. If you order early, the price is $499. I know you want to see this, so let's take a look at the video. It's a very slick looking thing. The, the propellers fold inward, to, I guess, for packaging or whatever. Now watch this. Throw it in the air and it just flies itself. Gets in a position and it just follows you. So we see a guy snowboarding and the view we're seeing is from the Lily camera. It's not a drone, but an incredible simulation. Yeah, a lot of reality TV cameramen just lost their jobs. Yeah. And now he's throwing it off a bridge. Make sure you turn the on button on first <laughs> before you throw it off a bridge, folks. And this is the side shot. So you program it in advance whether you want a side shot, a, you know, whatever, front shot, whatever you want, and it will do it. Now it has a waterproof case, so it's essentially a wrist strap inside of a, a waterproof housing. Now he just threw the drone in the water, and then it's taking off from the water, so it's waterproof. Hey, hey Mike, any idea how long this thing records? On, on a single sort of uh, charge. Jason is saying 20 minutes. And it's ultra portable, they say. They show somebody putting in a backpack. I wouldn't just put it in a backpack like that. What are they, nuts? And it's 900 bucks. All right, now somebody's throwing it, and off it goes. There's a shot uh, a fee, uh, option called the loop, where I'll just fly around in a circle around whoever's holding the magic puck. Joe, I gotta have one of these. This is just yeah. the coolest thing ever. And so, so here's a question for you: Is does it also have Wi-Fi so you can stream that message, that that image and video out to someone? No idea. I have no idea at all. Um, but uh, hopefully, we'll be getting more information about this as we go forward. And uh, who knows when it'll ship? But uh, it looks really, really cool. And of course, again, if you order early, it's 500 bucks. So that's a really good price for something like this. I think. Well, in news you can lose, Nestle is making 600,000 limited edition packages of Kit Kats. You know, the candy, the chocolate bar. The, the company will replace the word Kit Kat on the label with the word YouTube. It's part of a partnership with Google to celebrate the 80-year anniversary of Kit Kat's first sale in the UK. Remember that the two companies made a deal to use the brand Kit Kat for the K version of Android. Google will also enable the voice command, OK, Google, YouTube my break, which will bring up popular YouTube videos for some reason. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, it's kind of a collector's item, I guess, to have a Kit Kat bar that says YouTube on it, I guess. I sh yeah. So you're trying to strengthen your own brand and yet you print out 600,000 labels with someone else's brand. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a mystery, but you know what? It's sugar and chocolate. So how bad could it be? Our TNT fan of the day is Rainier uh, Times On in New Jersey, who posted this picture on Google+. He listens to the show while driving and hopefully doesn't watch the show while driving. That's the video version of the show, uh, which is great for listening to, but uh, please drive carefully. We want to hang on to all of our viewers and listeners. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Uh, Joe Panateri, what the heck is going on at After Nines? Uh, this may sound familiar, actually, to our uh, Thursday watchers who were with, with us last Thursday. At the time, I uh, dropped a hint that own backup CEO Sam Gutman would join me on a podcast. Well, that podcast finally went live. It's at afternines.com slash CEO. And what's really interesting about it, for anyone who's listening or watching who uses salesforce.com or servicenow.com or any other type of uh, business cloud applications, own Backup actually is doing cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup to protect those services, and Sam Gutman, the CEO, explains how they do it. Sounds very cool. Thank you so much, Joe Panateri, for co-anchoring today, and we will see you next Tuesday. All right, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Joe. Thanks again. Bye-bye.
Well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today via RSS. Always a great way to subscribe. Or you can choose another way at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. If you're ever in the San Francisco Bay Area, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on your favorite social media site and tag three of your friends along with your recommendation to subscribe. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV and you can follow me on Tumblr. MikeElgin.tumblr.com is that address. And also don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.